The first uh, speaker in the lung section will be Dr. Andrew Hirsch, speaking on chronic PE and CTEF, a clinical approach. Dr. Hirsch uh, is also a uh, Montreal, uh, lifetime, lifetime Montrealer. He graduated from McGill and went on to complete internal medicine training at McGill. He completed a pulmonary and critical care fellowship at UCSD in California, where he developed an interest in acute and th uh, chronic PE, as well as pulmonary hypertension. Returning to Montreal in 1997 as an assistant professor and attending physician at the Jewish General, he co-founded the Thrombosis Service and Patient Clinic and member of the Pulmonary Vascular Center, where he headed the CTEF program. So currently, uh, Dr. Hirsch is a busy uh, general pulmonologist with a special clinical and research interest in vascular pulmonary vascular medicine, including PE. He collaborates closely with our nuclear medicine colleagues uh, in the Jewish General. He runs the CTEF service, which is the only one in Quebec and only a few in Canada, and they perform invasive thrombo and rectomies and balloon angioplasties, as well as comprehensive medical care for these patients. He's uh, done a lot of research and published widely on uh, treatment of acute PE, as well as natural history and CTEF. So um, with, I don't want the introduction to be longer than the talk, so Dr. Hirsch, if you don't mind stepping up. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. This is actually my second time giving a lecture to nuclear medicine physicians, and I'm really happy to be here because I probably am the clinician who orders most lung scintillography at the Jewish General. Dr. Bixer may, uh, may be able to verify that. So I'm going to be talking about chronic PE uh, as opposed to acute PE. Um, really have no disclosures relevant to this talk. So I'm going to give a very, very brief introduction on pulmonary embolism, and then I'm going to talk about a case which I think highlights a lot of points of, of what I want to say in my talk, and hopefully by putting a patient story to, to what we do, uh, it'll help remember. I'm going to talk a little bit about this relatively new concept called post-PE syndrome, and then talk about the difference between chronic thromboembolic disease and chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And then in the last bit, I'm going to talk a little bit more about kind of the most major form of chronic PE called chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, or CTEF, and show you a little bit what we can do about it and why I think it's really important to diagnose it and how important nuclear medicine can be in that diagnosis. So just a little about PE, and I think everybody knows these kind of details. It's a common disease, important disease all over Canada, 20,000 hospitalizations or deaths in Canada, a lifetime incidence of about 5%. Um, third leading cause of cardiovascular mortality, and despite everything we do, about 5 to 10% of all deaths in North America, thromboembolism contributes. And over the years, and proudly a lot of it comes from Canada, we have really a lot of good studies on how to diagnose and treat pulmonary embolism now, and good diagnostic algorithms, very good treatment algorithms, good prevention algorithms. But in spite of all that, until relatively recently, we didn't have a lot of information about the long-term healthcare outcomes of pulmonary embolism. That's what I'm going to talk a little bit more about today. And I like showing this slide because it's the slide I showed maybe 15 years ago whenever I was giving a PE talk. And I show it now to show how much I think things have changed and to show you that I think this, by the end of the talk, you'll see this is probably wrong. So these are American numbers from a couple of decades ago. The numbers may not be all that different. It's the bottom part that's different. But about 5 million cases of DVT a year, about 10% of that causes chronic, causes acute pulmonary embolism that we diagnose. If you look for it, you probably find it a whole lot more often. 10% of people die. 
often before they can get to hospital and get diagnosed and treated, and about 90% resolved, except for a very few who developed this chronic pulmonary hypertension, which was thought to be a small, small number. And especially that resolution number, I think, is very, very wrong. And I hope I show you that today. So I'm going to skip gears a little bit and talk about a young lady we saw a couple of years ago. Um, I like showing her because I have lots of imaging and I think it illustrates some nice points about chronic PE. So she was a 43-year-old East Indian woman who had asthma in the past, no previous history of venous thromboembolism, non-smoker, mild asthma on some puffers, but came in with really quite severe class three dyspnea, couldn't walk up the stairs, couldn't do her daily activities. And then the day she came in, she had some chest pressure and almost fainted. Came into the eMERGE where she was tachycardic, a little hypoxemic, on exam had evidence of some right heart strain, was a little bit anemic with a high D-dimer and a normal chest X-ray, and got a CT angiogram. And I know you're nuclear medicine doctors, but I think everyone can see the clot sitting in the pulmonary, main pulmonary arteries there. And it was one of those scans where the more you looked at it, the more clot you would see. And she had, was quite sick and she ended up getting admitted to the medical ward where I'm not 100% clear why, but I was happy because <laughs> it turns out great for the talk. She actually had a VQ scan as well, even though we had a diagnosis. And it showed quite significant mismatches and large volume thromboembolic disease. She had an echocardiogram, which showed significant pulmonary hypertension and RV enlargement. And she was admitted, treated with anticoagulants. We did not thrombolyze her. And then she was discharged on rivaroxaban, which is one of our oral anticoagulants that we use routinely now. Followed her up in clinic, where we did some testing to see why she got this big clot and she was found to have a lupus anticoagulant, which is one of the risk factors for chronic PE and kind of an antibody that causes both arterial and venous clots. And then six months later, she was still on the anticoagulants, feeling better, but really had never regained where she was before. She was short of breath when she climbed stairs. She used to go to the gym regularly. She wasn't able to complete her exercise regimen. So what to do? Really, can you do nothing and just tell her it's normal to be a bit short of breath after a PE? Should we do more imaging? And if so, what should we do? A VQ scan, CT angiogram, echo. Since I'm here, you'll kind of guess what I ordered. <laughs> so I repeated her VQ scan. You have the original on the right and the six months on the left, and you can see that despite six months of anticoagulation, she still has very significant thromboembolic defects bilaterally. So we did go ahead and do another CT scan, and I'm not going to dwell on this, but you can see, whereas before she had that long strip of wide left lower lobe pulmonary embolism, now it kind of became a thin strand of a scarred down vessel. Echo still showed pulmonary hypertension. She had a cardiac catheterization, which we do to confirm the diagnosis. That I won't bore you with the numbers, but suffice it to say that she had severe pulmonary hypertension with a preserved cardiac output an angiogram that's not hers, that confirmed chronic thromboembolic disease. And we took her for a surgery called a pulmonary thromboendarterectomy, where we removed this chronic thromboembolic material from her, from her pulmonary arteries. And after the surgery, this is two days after the surgery, her pulmonary pressures went from 60 systolic to 30, her cardiac output increased, and the resistance in the pulmonary vasculature dropped to about a quarter of it was well into the normal range. And six months later, she was back exercising on the gym just on her anticoagulants. So this is not a typical case in that everything happened very, very quickly. But this is when we do diagnose and treat this chronic thromboembolic disease, these are the kind of results we can get. So what happens after a pulmonary embolism? 
There's a few things we know well. Mortality, you can die after a pulmonary embolism. It's rare to die from the PE, especially while you're on therapy. Um, but a lot of people, remember, a lot of people with PE have other severe medical illnesses, cancer, cardiovascular disease, heart failure, and the mortality from the underlying disease is much, much higher. You can get recurrent PE. Again, recurrent PE while on anticoagulants is really very low, about 3%, usually in people with malignancies. <clears throat> but when we stop their anticoagulants, especially in idiopathic disease, they can get up to a 30% recurrence rate by five years. And then we have the chronic PE, and this is really what I think has changed in recent years. We used to talk only about CTEF, which is a disease I just showed you, where you have to have clinical symptoms, pulmonary hypertension, which is defined by a mean pulmonary pressure more than 20, and angiographic evidence of disease. But really, it's just the severe end of a spectrum of long-term consequences of pulmonary embolism and how often people get less severe forms of pulmonary vascular disease really is not very, very well known. We and others have shown, we did a study in Canada here with 100 acute PE patients across Canada that we put through the ringer for a year after their PE and did repeat CTs, repeat VQ scans, PFTs, exercise tests, six minute walks, quality of life, all kinds of, testing, and we found that one year later, and these were mainly healthy people, half of them were still dyspneic, half of them had decreased quality of life, um, half of them had abnormalities on the VQ scan, although the correlation wasn't very, very good between the correlation and the, sim the obstruction and the symptoms, um, and and really they did not return completely to normal. And then groups in the Netherlands have subsequently shown more or less the same thing. This is what happened to their CT scans. Most got much, much better, but a number did not. And again, if you show a similar thing on VQ scan, you'll have more abnormalities on the VQ scan. So we call this the post-PE syndrome. A lot of people with dyspnea, decreased quality of life symptoms after their thromboembolism, and we divided that up even further. So we now talk about something called chronic thromboembolic disease, where you have persistent symptoms and persistent vascular obstruction that can be seen either on nuclear scanning or on CT angiograms, but no significant pulmonary hypertension, as opposed to CTEF, where you have all of the above, plus significant pulmonary hypertension. So if we want to look at it visually, after a PE, an awful lot of people have symptoms. This can be six months, one year. A good number of people will have evidence of residual obstruction, either on VQ or CT. Note there's some people who have residual obstruction and absolutely no symptoms. And a small percentage of people will have that triad of pulmonary hypertension symptoms and residual obstruction that we call chronic thromboembolic pH. So I'm gonna spend the last five or seven minutes because we're a little behind, I think, on, on CTEF and show you what we can do when we talk about this. So this is the most severe form of chronic thromboembolism. Its incidence really varies widely when you look at studies and you see numbers as low as 0.1%, others as high as 12%. But there was a recent meta-analysis that I think clinically comes pretty close to what we actually see in real life. If you see all comers, including people with cancers and post-orthopedic surgery and stuff like that, the incidence is really quite low. But in survivors who get six months of anticoagulation and have no major comorbidities, probably about 2 to 3% of people will develop this disease. And it sounds like a low number, but again, if you go back to the number of people with pulmonary emboli, it really is a significant number. And we certainly do not see this amount of patients clinically, and it is an underdiagnosed 
disease. Those are the risk factors. I'm not going to go through it now in the interest of time, but if you did have a large PE, if you did have pulmonary hypertension on your initial clot, you're more likely to get it. So basically, we think that what happens is that the clot does not resolve completely. The thrombus organizes and enters the wall, gets persistent vascular obstruction, probably some predisposition to small vessel disease and in situ thrombosis, and this is the end result. When do we think about it? We really think about it in two groups of patients, post acute pulmonary embolism when they still have persistent symptoms after three to six months with dyspnea and exercise intolerance, which as I said, is a large number of patients. And the other time we think about it is when we're investigating people with dyspnea and we find that they have pulmonary hypertension. How do we screen? Echocardiogram is invaluable, and we use the echocardiogram to find evidence of right ventricular dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension. And then we look for vascular obstruction, okay? And we could use either VQ or CTPA. Sorry, but the British did a head-to-head -head study in people with CTEF and people without CTEF. And I'll just show you the bottom line. Basically, if you had a normal VQ scan with pulmonary hypertension, the negative predictive value was 99%. So a normal or a non-high probability VQ scan in the face of pulmonary hypertension essentially rules out CTEF, whereas CT missed about 20% of cases, um, probably because it Again, as I sort of told you, the clot goes from being very central in the acute PE and the CTs, especially the multi-detector scanners are great at seeing that, to intraluminal, and they can be much more difficult to see, especially if you're not particularly looking for it. So I'm not going to talk too much about what you see on the VQ scan, because I think Dr. Abixer is going to do that in a minute. But if you see large defects like this, it's pretty diagnostic. Whereas if you see a modeled appearance like this, it's much more common in other forms of small vessel pulmonary hypertension. CT is still useful to tell us where the clots are. And you can see more chronic changes, webs, irregularities in the artery, um, prominent bronchial arteries, and mosaic perfusion. So we still use it. So after an acute PE, if they have persistent symptoms or are at high risk for CTEF, I do screen with VQ scan and or echo. Why is it important? Because we have really good treatments, okay, especially for the CTEF. We have surgical treatments, we have medical treatments, and we now have a new technique called balloon pulmonary angioplasty. The surgery treatment is a big deal. It's uh, open heart surgery. It's called a pulmonary thromboendarterectomy. The surgeon puts the patient on bypass, opens up the pulmonary artery, and removes this chronic thromboembolic material. Like this, we love getting those long tails out because it means we're getting some of the distal disease and it means they'll, they'll do better long-term in terms of hemodynamics. And as I said, it's difficult surgery. It's somewhat dangerous surgery. It takes good judgment to pick the right patients. But when we do it, patients do very, very well. Their pulmonary pressures drop to near normal range. Their vascular resistance drops. About 50 up to 80% of people get complete resolution of their pulmonary hypertension. Almost everybody gets improvement in their symptoms and their functional class. And exercise tolerance is measured by six minute walk or more fancy exercise testing. And in expert centers, Mortalities now can be as low as 3%, so really quite good when you pick the right patients. This is just showing the functional class. Remember, class 3 is dyspneic on minimal exertion. Class 4 is dyspneic at rest. So most many patients pre-op were in class 3 and class 4, and almost everybody post-op gets to class 1 and class 2. And this is just a group of people with CTEF, again, from the British who do very good work with this. The red line is the mortality, not randomized, okay, just retrospective. 
but people who are operated for CTEF with a very good mortality curve and people who could not be operated with the same diagnosis with a much worse prognosis. I'm not going to talk about the medical therapy, but we do sometimes use medical therapy in pulmonary vasodilators, and we can show improvement in exercise tolerance in people who are not surgical candidates because the clots are too far away. And the last thing I want to talk about just for the last few minutes is this balloon pulmonary angioplasty, which is a new procedure. Really, I think only two or three centers in Canada are doing it now. It's older, like they started looking at this in the 1980s, but had a lot of mortality, probably because they were using big balloons and being a bit too aggressive. But in Japan, where they didn't have as much access to surgical therapy, they persisted and really kind of perfected this technique. And what they do is they go into the distal small vessels of the lung where it's difficult to get surgically. They put in these balloons, dilate, and you get really nice flow afterwards. And you have to do multiple sessions. It's quite labor intensive, but you can see before BPA and after BPA that you really can improve the perfusion of the lung and one for the nucleus is, this is a patient who had multiple sessions of balloon pulmonary angioplasty and showing how much better the, the lung perfusion gets with time. So overall, chronic thromboembolic disease is a rare condition, but not very, very uncommon. And we can make a huge difference in the treatment once we make the diagnosis. We now think of it as a three compartment model. The proximal disease we can remove with surgery, the small vessel in the pulmonary arterial segmental and subsegmental pulmonary arteries we can treat with balloons, and the distal microvascular disease that I didn't talk too, too much about, we can treat with pulmonary vasodilators. We now have over 200 patients in our CTEF clinic in Montreal, and really the vast majority of them are doing really well with one or multiple of these therapies, um, whereas if we didn't diagnose them and didn't treat them, most of them go on to write heart failure and death. So in conclusion, CTEF characterized by organizing thrombotic obstruction in the pulmonary arteries, it, they can get small vessel disease similar to other forms of pulmonary arterial hypertension. It's uncommon but not rare. Untreated leads to significant morbidity and mortality due to pulmonary hypertension and progressive right heart failure. And treatment with surgery, balloon pulmonary angioplasty, or medication, or a combination of the above can lead to marked improvement in survival, exercise tolerance, and quality of life. And I'll stop there.